From the headquarters of Talatio English in Quito, Ecuador, this is From the South, and I am Sweeney Gray. The Senate in Argentina is scheduled to vote the 2019 budget bill on Wednesday afternoon. The project has already been approved in the lower house, but there have been heavy protests against the budget during the session. The 2019 budget is more than 4 trillion pesos large with a 23% inflation rate for December next year. Workers from Air Lineas Argentinas are condemning a campaign by the ruling Cambemos Alliance that seeks to privatize the state-owned airline. A representative from the pilot union said the government of Mauricio Macri is trying to pit airline workers against the people. By spreading fake news about their working conditions and wages, the union says these attacks are meant to help justify the adjustment measures imposed on the people at the request of the International Monetary Fund. Other news now, after breaking away from the main caravan in Mexico City, a group of migrants have arrived at the border city of Tijuana. About 400 people reached the border city via buses. They hope to be granted asylum in the United States, but the U.S. military has sent additional security personnel to the border to prevent their entry. The migrants say they remain under term despite the hostile response of the Trump administration. U.S. troops in Texas have begun to lay barbed wire at the border for the various migrant caravans who are approaching the U.S.-Mexico border. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection Agency has announced they will also close down lanes at the border crossing and set up barricades. This is all part of President Trump's hardline stance against the caravan, which includes sending nearly 15,000 troops to the border after suspending asylum Request from anyone who enters illegally. The U.S. Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, is expected to visit the border on Wednesday. Our correspondent in Mexico, Pablo Perez, is in Jalisco and has more details about the migrants' ongoing journey. Well, we are right now at El Arenal, Jalisco. This place is uh, around 40 kilometers out of uh, Guadalajara, the place where the migrant caravan stayed for the last night. And this is the place where the, uh, they, they were taken by buses. And so far, the, they still have to uh, walk or travel by their own means the next 90 kilometers until uh, the town of uh, Ixtlán del Rio Nayarit. Nayarit, the next state in their, in their route, is has been severely damaged by the by hurricane will so the authorities in the state of Nayarit they say that they cannot take care of the migrant caravan because they have their shelters occupied already with over 130 people that have been uh, the, the damaged in their properties by the hurricane so what uh, Nayarit state is offering is a bus ride from the southern border of the state to the northern border, where they are limited with uh, Sinaloa. So right now, the migrant caravan has to travel 90 kilometers until the next uh, state, so they can ride by bus another 200 kilometers. So, it, so it, this is going to be one of the lo longest journeys in one day they have uh, made so far. And we will keep you informed. The lawyer of the Mexican drug lord, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, has said the Sinaloa cartel paid bribes to President Enrique Peña Nieto and his predecessor, Felipe Calderon. El Chapo faces 17 criminal charges and a potential life sentence if convicted. Federal prosecutors say the presumed leader of the Sinaloa, Sinaloa cartel shipped massive amounts of drugs to the United States. President Enrique Peña Nieto and the former president, Felipe Calderon, have denied the accusations. During the trial in New York, El Chapo's lawyer said his client was a scapegoat and was not the real leader of the Sinaloa cartel. He said Ishmael El Mayo Zambada is the one who actually rules the cartel and he lives free in Mexico and is bribing the entire government, including the president. 
Audio recordings have been released accusing the Attorney General Nestor Umberto Martinez of knowing about the Odebrecht bribery network since 2015. Our correspondent in Bogota, Juan Manuel Jimenez, brings us more details. Colombia's Attorney General Nestor Humberto Martinez has been singled out once again in the Odebrecht corruption scandal. A local news outlet has released a series of audio clips recorded by the former auditor of the Corfi Colombia, Jorge Enrique Pizano, Odebrecht's partner in the country. Back then, in 2015, Martinez was the lawyer of Corfi Colombia and Pisano allegedly informed him about irregularities regarding the operations of Odebrecht. One year later, Martinez became Colombia's attorney general. He never said a word about what Pisano informed him or the possible influences Odebrecht had to develop its projects in Colombia. Now, some politicians have urged the attorney to resign and for the judiciary to nominate an independent prosecutor to carry the investigation on this case. In the upcoming days, these politicians will promote a debate in Congress for political control. This is not the first time Attorney General Martinez has been involved in corruption scandals. We'll keep you updated with the latest in our next report. Social activists have been expelled from the UNESCO headquarters in Paris just before Colombia's President Yvonne Duque delivered a speech. The activists were protesting the increasing death of social leaders in their country. Videos circulating via social media saw security personnel removing the demonstrators from the building. They said other Colombian citizens were also barred from attending the event. Meanwhile, dozens of indigenous leaders have gathered in Colombia's capital, Bogota, to demand that the government fulfill its guarantees of peace and protection in times of conflict. Members of the indigenous communities from the Department of Choco arrived in Bogota demanding a solution to the ongoing violence they have to endure. Over 4,000 members of our communities have been detained since the signing of the peace agreement. Nearly 2,000 of us have been displaced all over the country. Territorial control by the ELN and other armed groups, as well as the growth of the black market, has contributed to the escalation of violence, especially in the Valle del Cauca and Narino and Choco regions. We are finding illegal numbers, illegal mining operations, there is blackmailing of local mines, there is armed trafficking, drug trafficking, and even people trafficking. Experts argue for the government to implement effective policies to tackle this humanitarian crisis, policies that will develop and empower indigenous communities, not marginalize them further. Sometimes the single policy of sending the military is not accompanied by other policies that would help communities. There are no attempts to eradicate illegal crops. There is no help to be given so that we may learn better agricultural practices. These communities continue to live under threat and feel very unsettled. Even their daily lives are at risk because they face landmines and the murders of their leaders. Seven of our friends were recently killed, including a teacher and one of our governors. The indigenous people of Choco insist they won't leave Bogota until the government lives up to its promises. Brazil's president-elect, Jair Bolsonaro, has met with the president of the Superior Electoral Court, Rosa Weber. During their meeting in Brasilia, Weber gave Bolsonaro a copy of the country's constitution. A special ceremony scheduled for December 10th at the Superior Electoral Court will declare Bolsonaro as fit to take office on January 1st. I have a constitution to offer. I know you already have one. I know it pretty much by heart. But this one is the one from the DSE, and the DSE is the court of democracy. President-elect Jair Bolsonaro has named a retired general as defense minister. Fernando Acevedo Il Silva, advisor of the Supreme Court president, and a former military man will become the future minister of defense. Six ministers have already been named, including Acevedo de Silva. Citizens in Venezuela are highlighting the positive impact their cryptocurrency, the Petro, is having in the country's economy. More in this report. In a country where economic attacks by international governments are becoming more and more evident, Venezuelans are adapting progressively to the new digital economic era. 
We have to adapt to these new times, which are best for the economy. Economies are very dynamic, and Venezuela, of course, cannot be left behind. We should all make an effort to know the details on how to use the petro in our daily life. They describe the boom of the petro as an economic revolution. I think that what Venezuela is doing with the petro is equivalent to what Venezuela did with the Spanish Empire. Venezuela is creating global change out of historic necessity. The creation of a national body to regulate crypto assets and their related activities serves so that Venezuelans can directly purchase assets using the petro without financial intermediaries. I think it is a win for all Venezuelans to participate and help this process to make the country better. Until now, the signing contracts in Petros has exceeded $600 million and many more millions in currencies like the euro and yuans. Recently, the government announced that the Petro will be presented to the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, as a form of currency to sell the Venezuelan oil starting in the first quarter of 2019. More news in a minute. Stay with us. Our actions have an impact on the environment. our responsibility to change for the sake of our planet. Let's be part of this transition. Watch, preserve and protect your green zone. Wednesday, only on Telesur. Welcome back. A young woman in El Salvador is facing 20 years in prison for attempted murder after she allegedly tried to have an abortion. 20-year-old Imelda Cortez had been raped repeatedly by her 70-year-old stepfather since she was 12. At 18, she gave birth to a child while alone at home, and complications during the delivery made her bleed very heavily. When her mother eventually found her and took her to the hospital, the doctors called the police because they thought she had tried to have an abortion. Now, her lawyers say there isn't enough evidence to convict her, and feminist organizations are criticizing the case because Cortez is the victim, but she's the one facing criminal charges. Another criminal investigation against the former president of Peru, Alberto Fujimori, is underway, this time related to mass forced sterilizations of indigenous women that were carried out during his time in office. Fujimori and three of his former ministers have been accused of the crime. Now, according to the Ombudsman's office, nearly 300,000 forced sterilizations were performed between 1996 and 2001. The women were reportedly threatened and sometimes forced into undergoing the procedure. Our correspondent in Peru, Jaime Herrera, has more details. Senior Prosecutor Marcelita Gutierrez has filed a lawsuit against former President Alberto Fujimori and four of his former ministers and other officials. They are being accused of crimes against humanity in regards to the forced sterilization of hundreds of thousands of indigenous women. There are even talks of five women who died because of this practice. Around 2,100 testimonies have been gathered from women who were forcibly sterilized as part of a birth control program imposed during Fujimori's administration. Women organizations have said there is finally going to be justice for this crime, which has long been condemned. Some of the evidence in this case are orders from the health ministry about sterilization quotas in health centers. 
especially in Quechua-speaking regions. What is known now is that in the coming days, former ministers Costa Bauer and Alejandro Aguinaga, the current doctor for Fujimori, could be called to testify. More women in Bolivia are working in mining every day. Over the last decade, they've even worked inside the tunnels, which had been forbidden for centuries due to cultural beliefs. This meeting gathered minor women to analyze their current labor conditions. In the mines, they've been traditionally left to recover whatever they can from the remains that men produce. Many still continue this task. I work with the mineral waste of my male co-workers. They wash the minerals and whatever they discard is what we recover. There are different types of mining activities. The first, public mining, offers better labor conditions. In the second, private mining, companies usually work in illegal areas where nonetheless women have been included. The men decide whether a woman will or won't participate or if can be as strong as a man. We can't be seen as inferior, so we must keep working. For centuries, women were forbidden from entering the mines due to cultural reasons. Tradition says that if a woman enters the mine, accidents will occur. Things are different now. Ten or fifteen years ago, women weren't allowed inside. Now, no one dares to say that. Women go in, work, and even form squads. A squad is made of 12 to 13 people. There are even women who are squad leaders of teams that also have men. Recent studies on this sector revealed that 50% of the working women are widows, divorced, or single mothers. 60% lack free access to health care, and only 5% wear security gear because the gear that they can find in the country is designed for men. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, has said the joint natural gas deals signed with Venezuela represent a new era in regional cooperation. Trinidad and Venezuela signed a major energy cooperation deal back in August. Ro Dr. Rowley said the United States wants a major import of gas, is now a competing exporter. The Jagan deal is a prime example of the symbiotic relationship between Trinidad and Tobago and its nearest neighbor, Venezuela, and an indication of cooperation among neighbors, but more importantly, among two founding members of the GCF member countries. Additionally, the Caribbean region is becoming a hotbed for hydrocarbon exploration. Recent successes in exploration in Guyana has prompted interests in Suriname, Cuba, Barbados, Grenada, and Guyana. These countries can benefit from Trinidad's experience in the hydrocarbon arena, while providing opportunities for Trinidad and Tobago in many aspects of the hydrocarbon value chain. Our correspondent in Trinidad and Tobago, Kijan Haynes, has the details. Now, the theme of this meeting could all be about change and adapting to change, with the United States moving from a major importer of natural gas to exporter and other shifts in the status quo. It means Trinidad now needs to figure out how to export gas to new countries. Now, some of those countries are in Asia or Africa, and that's, of course, much further away than the U.S., which means it's more expensive and more logistical to send it there. And the price of gas has not changed. And smaller countries like Trinidad and Tobago, though major exporters of natural gas, don't actually have a say in the actual setting of the gas prices. And that's why the Prime Minister called for more transparency in the way the price natural gas is set. Now, so for countries like Trinidad and Tobago, it's all about diversifying and adapting to this new natural gas world. That could mean becoming mentors, so to speak, of other emerging markets, like in Equatorial Guinea or Ghana in Africa, or even closer to home, Guyana or Grenada. And of course, there's climate change. Prime Minister Rowley, in his address, acknowledged the importance of climate change and the move to renewable energy. But remember, natural gas is still the country's bread and butter. So he hasn't been, and probably will not be, quick to condemn non-renewable energy. We thank Kijan for that report. Now, the Caribbean Court of Justice has ruled that a law in Guyana is unconstitutional. The law made it illegal for any person to appear in public while dressed as the opposite sex. The ruling in the case determined that the law was vague and violated the right to protection 
under the law. The 16th edition of the Homeless World Cup has kicked off with a colorful ceremony in Mexico City. The tournament will bring together more than 400 players from over 40 countries. The tournament seeks to empower people who have experienced homelessness to build skills and better relationships. The real heroes are the players themselves who have used football to transform their lives. And they are here today in front of us. The journey you have been on has been difficult and sometimes impossible, but you have proved everyone wrong. And now you are here representing your country. You are the heroes and I salute you. We'll take another short break now. World News is next. developing events being presented through analysis. Our coverage transcends borders. With renowned journalist Walter Martinez. Salud amigos, tripulantes de nuestra querida, contaminada y única nave espacial. Dossier. Weekdays. Only on Telesur. Y ponga usted de las cámaras, señor director. Welcome back. At least 15 people have been killed in a new round of fighting between the Cameroonian military forces and separatist rebels. Both the military and the separatists confirm the recent clashes, though they both have different vision of the events leading up to them. Separatist militias launched an insurrection in 2017 against the predominantly francophone central government after it violently suppressed peaceful protests against the perceived marginalization of the English-speaking minority. The South African Home Affairs Minister, Mulosi Gagaba, has resigned after mounting pressure. A statement released by the President, Cyril Ramaphosa, confirmed that he'd accepted Gagaba's resignation. Gagaba had been under pressure to resign after a public standards watchdog revealed that he violated the con Constitution by lying under oath while in court. He said he's chosen to place the interests of the African National Congress and the country above his own. Now, activists in Burkina Faso are urging for better conditions in women's prisons for imprisoned women and their children. Most of the convicted women have no choice but to take their children into jail with them. This despite severe hygiene issues and a lack of resources to properly care for them. They want the authorities to provide services and welfare for their children. They don't have baby medicine here as she's not officially a prisoner. The living conditions are not good, so it's not easy. In detention and correctional centers here, almost everything is treated with paracetamol. But babies need liquid medicine that swallow. That's something we need to take into account. The current provision, it doesn't exist. The Palestinian Permanent Observer for the United Nations, Riyad Mansour, has urged the Security Council to take action against Israel's aggression. He has condemned the latest round of violence in the Gaza Strip and expressed hope for a ceasefire that would last. Uh, we want the Security Council to shoulder its responsibility with regard to this situation threatening international peace and security. And it is unfortunately the Security Council is paralyzed it did not shoulder its responsibility. Nevertheless, we will keep knocking on the door of the Security Council to shoulder its responsibility. 
Palestinian resistance groups in the Gaza agreed to a new ceasefire broken by Egypt. However, they only agreed to hold the cross-border attacks that have intensified over the last few hours if the Israeli forces do the same. Gaza residents celebrated the ceasefire in the streets. People came out today because of the victory of the resistance factions and these people support it. We tell the resistance factions all the people are being you and this is victory of the Palestinians. We congratulate ourselves and we congratulate our people because we have this brave resistance faction which have proof and keep on providing every day that they are responsible and can repulse the aggression and rein it. Syrian President Bashar al-Assad has met with Sweda hostages freed from the Islamic State group. Assad received the group at the presidential palace in Damascus among them. 19 women and children who were freed by the Syria's army. The southern city of Sweda is mainly populated by the Druze people, a community threatened by the Islamic State group. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations Summit has kicked off in Singapore with warnings on the negative effect of protectionism. At the opening ceremony, Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Hsien Long expressed his concern about what he called the new international strategic trends against multilateralism. Other leaders have also said they are worried about the effects of protectionist measures and their domino effect. They fear this position may undermine ASEAN's growth and stability. And we've come to the end of this news brief for these and many other stories. You can find them on our website at tellusyourenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, remember we are on Star Star Channel 461 in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. And join us on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Tell us your English. I'm Sweeney Gray. Thank you for watching.